Well, it's a great pleasure to address amendments 156A and 156B, which are in this group, but also to follow the noble Baroness Lady Mackintosh of Pickering and what she said about the Scottish Law Society, and I very much associate myself with, with her remarks. In turning the attention of the committee, if I may, to these two amendments, they're, they're con the, the kernel of those amendments is, is contained in 1ZA, guidance issued under subsection 1 must in particular provide that the determination mentioned in paragraph C is to be made on the stand standard of suspect but cannot prove. And in my explanatory statement, again I won't read it all, but it says that the amendment would ensure that amendments made to the Modern Slavery Act of 2015 do not raise the threshold, the point the Noble Baroness has just referred to, for a reasonable grounds decision when accessing the national refer referral mechanism in line uh, with modern slavery. The one thing that came out of the last debate was it was pretty clear that the whole House has agreed about one thing, that the national referral mechanism is vitally important to the recovery and safety of survivors of modern slavery. Since its introduction in what the noble Lord Lord Coker was right to refer to as landmark legislation, a, a point that was echoed by the noble and learned Lord when he was replying to that previous debate, the 2015 legislation, landmark legislation, has allowed us to identify survivors and ensure they receive the right support and are able to assist law enforcement in tackling this abhorrent trade in human beings, in human suffering. I should say that I'm very grateful to my noble friend, Lady Prashant, and to the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, for signing uh, 156A. Accessing the NRN is the crucial first step on a survivor's journey to recovery, giving them access to vital legal and financial support, access to safe accommodation, and an exit from the kind of exploitation that the noble and learned Lady Baroness Butler Sloss referred to earlier on. It enables them to start the process of rebuilding their lives, empowering themselves and even bravely supporting the prosecution of traffickers so more potential victims are saved from exploitation. First established in 2009 and supported by successive governments, the NRM was recently highlighted by the Organisation for Security Cooperation in Europe as being a key element in the fight to end slavery. Since then, with the introduction of the 2015 Modern Slavery Act, the UK has become a world leader in this fight and a beacon of hope for those who have been trafficked and enslaved. However, as the noble and learned Lord said earlier on, and I agree with him on in this sense, the national referral mechanism isn't perfect, and that's clear. But the opportunity to do something about that is up the track. There is no need for this whole part five to be incorporated in this bill. It's inconsistent with much else that is in the bill anyway. And as the noble and learned Lord told the House earlier on that there is to be new legislation, why on earth can't we wait for that to come? There's an old saying that when you legislate in haste, you repent at leisure. And that is what we will do if we simply push this through in a pell-mell way. So it may not be perfect, but it's better than anything else at the moment, and we should be very, very careful about uh, what we do to it. There's a catalogue of confusion and delays, but I'm sure the government doesn't believe that the only solution to this is simply to reduce the number of poor people who are able to access support. But that, my lords, is exactly what Clause 59 will do, effectively increasing the threshold that these traumatised individuals must meet almost from the get-go to receive support will not only leave many with either the choice of slavery or destitution, but would fundamentally undo the years of hard work by government, by police, by NGOs, by charity and members of both houses. Even now, far too many survivors go unrecognised and are excluded from support. Despite our understanding of the nature of trauma and the horrors so many have gone through, Many do not receive a reasonable grounds decision, and they are forced to reapply. In the previous debate, we were urged to get into the real world. Well, I think the noble Lord, Lord Coker, had a better definition of what the real world is than the one we heard from the government front bench. And I would do as the noble Baroness Lady Hamway did earlier on, and give one example, if I may. 
which I'd like to share with the House. It's the case of a, a poor woman who was the victim of trafficking and violent sexual exploitation. By the time she arrived in the UK, she already had severe PTSD. Her symptoms included involuntary numbing, avoidance, dissociation, and shame. She failed to disclose her trafficking experience in her early interactions with the Home Office due to the severe trauma that she had experienced. My Lord, these inconsistencies later contributed to her receiving a negative decision on her trafficking claim. However, these inconsistencies need to be understood in the context, as I said in my earlier remarks, of prolonged exposure to trauma at an early age and fear of reprisals from her abusals. Clause 59 raises risking the threshold for a positive reasonable grounds decision at this vital first stage, meaning survivors like that woman will be forced to meet an even higher threshold of evidence almost immediately before they have access safety, a lawyer, a translator or advocate to help provide the evidence that is expected of them. The noble lord, the noble and learned lord who addressed the House earlier on uh, has promised to write to the noble lord Coker, myself and others with more data. Here's a little bit of data that I would share with the noble lord Lord Sharp. It's worth noting that 81% of all negative decisions at this first stage, which were reconsidered, were found to have been wrong, and the victim deserved a positive reasonable grounds decision. Currently, there are an estimated 136,000 victims of modern slavery in the UK, and a little over 10,000 were referred to the NRM in 2020. That means, my lords, that there are a vast number of individuals who have been trafficked and enslaved in our country and are already far from the safety offered by the national referral mechanism. Were we to raise the threshold to access safety and support, surely, my lords, that would only play into the hands of traffickers and the slave masters by preventing survivors from sharing their experience and supporting criminal investigations. I note that the government has denied that Clause 59 will increase the threshold and that the intention behind the clause is to bring us in line with the European Convention on Action Against Trafficking, ECAT. However, many of those in the anti-slavery movement, and we've heard a lot of references to that <coughs> earlier, and who are on the ground in the real world supporting vulnerable people every day, believe that it's already harder today to get a positive decision than it was even a year ago. As such, if not remedied in the guidance, the change in language represented in this clause would effectively raise the NRM threshold. Furthermore, the government have rightly decided to include on the face of the bill that conclusive grounds decisions be made on the balance of probabilities. If the intention is not to raise the threshold, then I simply ask the noble lord, the minister, that they put on the face of the bill that reasonable grounds decisions be made on the tried and trusted standard of suspect but cannot prove, which is the essence of these amendments 156A and B. That would allow the government to change the language of the Modern Slavery Act to be more in line with ECAT, provide greater consistency between conclusive and reasonable grounds decisions on the face of the bill, and vitally wouldn't raise the threshold for survivors of trafficking to receive a positive decision, therefore ensuring that these poor people receive the support they so desperately need and the authorities have the evidence that they need to end slavery. Let me come to a conclusion. This is what ECAT actually say, Article 10.2. If the competent authorities have reasonable grounds to believe that a person has been a victim of trafficking in human beings, that person shall not be removed from its territory until the identification process as victim of an offence has been completed. Both ECAT and the Modern Slavery Act envisage that support is given to victims through the NRM at the earliest stage possible when someone is identified as a potential victim, raising the threshold to only those who have proved status as a victim of trafficking would undermine the point of the three-stage referral system currently in place. This support is crucial to enable victims to make any discourses from a position of safety. Now, the Minister will no doubt say in his response that the NRM may have been abused, but I would ask him to provide the justification of that claim. It's something that Noble Lord Lord Coker and I raised earlier on. Where is the data? 
Uh, I'd refer the noble lord to the rights lab of the University of Nottingham's report for evidence as to why the NRM is not being abused. Indeed, my lords, by many reports, one of the largest problems with our NRM is, is that it's underutilised. There are already a low number of referrals to the NRM. According to the Global Slavery Index, the estimated figures for prevalence of modern slavery in the UK are around 136,000. Yet in 2020, only 10,000 613 potential victims were referred to the NRM. Raising the threshold would only serve to even further restrict those who would access the vital resources of the NRM. Therefore, I felt it necessary to table these amendments. Those who are referred to the NRM are often the most vulnerable and in the most traumatic moments of their lives. We shouldn't be raising the threshold. We should be doing everything we can to facilitate their access to support. Uh, and I beg to move.